Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, I can rerun it. Got it. Okay, cool. <clears throat> so we're going to call this Ansible. All right, so anyway, so for the... Uh, let's see if this is done. So these are booted up, but let's see if it's done provisioning in the background. So Terraform is interesting, but it's only good at trying to get things set up initially. So uh, if you want to see what Terraform is doing in the background... Basically what's going down is each little of these blocks or resources here, make this a little smaller, um, are what's going on for provisioning. So this is the actual meat and potatoes of what's, of what it's trying to do. And then for each little like step to like try to provision after that, this will only work once and it's only at the time of provisioning, which is your SSH for the remote exec. Um, this would be the equivalent of using Cloud init. Is everyone familiar with cloud init? Okay. Well, I am, but uh, basically the way to think of this is like one uh, set of command prompt sort of things that will work no matter which cloud provider you're using. Gotcha. With a little bit of hand waving. Wrapper. Yes. The, uh, uh, no, I wouldn't put a wrapper. It's a uh... It's like a it's a shell based thing where you basically drop in a file that once the system comes up, instead of having like your like right now this is going once it's uh, once it can grab all the information and it gets information from the uh, like the state uh, that it can accept an SSH connection. Remote exec will go run each one of these lines, so line 23, 24, whatever that kind of stuff one at a time. Okay. And then we'll execute that against each uh, uh, system. Now, so for this, because I only need one controller node, there's one controller node. And then I have the setup, so it takes a variable in here. So essentially it'll loop over these and then it'll make these number of workers. Okay. And okay. each system will have this remote exec, so it'll grab its IP address information and go connect and then just run it. After you've provisioned it from a running system, Terraform's garbage. You cannot do much except for like edit tags, um, metadata things, things that the cloud provider exposes, but anything that on the runtime system, it can't do much. So be very careful about when people say, oh, Ter it's just like Terraform. Um, Terraform has a very limited uh, scoped experience that it's good at. Yeah, and people will usually use that kind of Terraform provisioning process when it's uh, cattle and not pets, right? So it's like, I have a new version. I kill all the old stuff I bring up for new. Uh, yes. Works. Well, no, they still even use it when they have persistent systems because they just maintain the entire infrastructure. And then you can use things like the option to create before destroy. So you can crab walk entire, let's say, Kubernetes clusters. Crab walking is a fancy term to say, I'm going to shut down one system, bring up a new one, and then provision it. And once you bring a new system, you shut down the old one and then just continues down an entire list of inventory. So some uh, institutions have, or some companies have some rules where instead of patching systems are in place every, let's say 90 days, you have to rebuild all your running instances. Yeah. So it's pretty much forcing like blue green every 30 days essentially instead of patching. But yeah, once you have the, the inventory there, then it's just a simple, uh, for me, just run this K3s thing and voila, you're gonna have a Kubernetes cluster ready to go. And that's pretty much it. I mean, the, the Ansible is just take, once you have the inventory done, it connects things and allows you to control whatever the state is. Now I will show there is something I, I do need to do because I'm going to show what uh, um, what Longhorn is because to install that I have to enable uh, system D iSCSI interface or sorry I have, to, I have to use system D in order to turn on iSCSI on all the nodes. So I have just have some simple one liner um, Ansible here where by the way nodes just is like a it's like a parent child relationship thing. Um, the uh, controllers is a node, workers are a node. So I can go through each one of those groups or nodes grabs all the, uh, all the ones and how my inventory is written. 
Um, you can also use the uh, keyword all if you want to, but I just got used to this. But basically it's gonna do system D and I'm gonna go look for the iSCSI unit file and then turn it on. And then it's going to install this kubectl thing, which oh, reminds me, oh, actually let's go look at that. Um, I'm using Ansible. So one very nice thing about Ansible versus using something like, uh, uh, was it like a landscape is if I'm on a system and I need to go SSH in, have another user and grab a file and have it handle all the weird, you know, ways of like changing users and permissions and that kind of stuff. That's essentially what this line three is doing here, which is it's going through the Ansible through controllers, actually controller zero. So it's the specific first controller node if there are multiple. The module is fetch, which means I wanna go grab the file, which I'm gonna go grab this K3's file. And then the destination is actually gonna grab it locally and put it in my cube config file. Flat means it's not going to do some crazy folder structure when it goes to grab it locally. Then down here, I'm actually going to run use Ansible for the config um, for uh, messing with single file. So this would be the equivalent of doing like a sed command inside of it, but I'm using the Ansible variables to replace inside the cube config. Because uh, when I grab it from the uh, controller node, it's going to be, you know, this 127. But really, I want to put the controller node URL which if I go in here and put in um, uh, edit, which one is it going to be? Uh, the Linode host, nope, not Linode. Flip that around for that. Okay, so I have a right here, the controller URL is found here. So that variable is going to be used up top to update the controller node for it. So by doing this, now, once that's run, I can do cube CTL, get modes, and now that command now works. And that's all using the private key that's up there for connecting to that. Now, as I mentioned, I have that other script for the Longhorn, which is going to go turn on iSCSI, which looks absolutely horrible at first, but then it's going to link in. So this way I can mix in commands running locally with stuff that I need to do remotely all together. And, and now Longhorn is a uh, high high availability. Uh, oh yeah, everyone's gonna be able to play cluster. with it. I'm gonna I'm gonna throw a link right in uh, in there for everyone once I expose it. So give me a second. Uh, let's go to services. They always do this thing where they put a you know, cluster IP on it. So let me go edit that quick. So I want to change this to load type no load balancer load balancer, and I'm gonna stick this on port 89. Just a lot of conflicts. And once it goes and shows, come on. There we go. And I grab this. I'm gonna go over to, um, what do you call it? Where's the chat for this? All right, I need to hit control H, I think it is for that to pop up or hit press the chat button. There we go. And then port 90. Or 89, put a little HTTP in there, and voila. So that link I just posted, when I go to click on it, is now going to let everyone access the high availability storage that's on my Kubernetes cluster I just deployed in front of everyone. Now, one th Say that again? I said, let's see if it's vulnerable to log for j no, no, everything I use does not use Java. And the only reason why JavaScript is used is just because client side, it does such a good job for things. But yeah, that's pretty much it. And then you create oh. volumes and stuff. Try not to crash it if you can help it, but some nodes. Anyway, now that we're completely off track. But the main reason why I recommend getting used to Ansible, and one thing I would like to see with Landscape as for parity, is if there's a capability to uh, group systems, run certain commands against those groups, use the feedback from one system to feed it to another. Um, reason being is that for, let's say, launching clusters of certain software, could be Kubernetes, could be a database, could be, you know, if you want to be very masochistic, you can use Gluster. Um, 
that is something I would be very curious about. Yeah, they do package profiles. Is there a uh, software grouping? So you, you create that profile. Uh, I think they have an API for it too. And then you can like push that out to certain groups. You can also, you can group your systems too, like put each system in a group. So, you know, you can have your, your Kubernetes cluster group, and then you can use your uh, package profile to apply stuff to that group. Or, you know, work however you want to handle it. Okay. You know, so, so long as it's running Ubuntu, it's the host box. <laughs> Yeah, you know, which I, I don't know that I choose that to be the uh, the uh, bare metal for my uh, just edit your LSB tags. Nobody will know, dude. Speaking of weird bare, bare metal stuff, they have this thing called MAAS Metal as a Service. Yeah, I've seen that. I've not played with it, I have not either, but it looked really interesting. Once I rebuild my server, I intend to fiddle with it. Yeah. But not until I rebuild my server. It's it's unstable enough as it is. <laughs> so until it gets migrated and rebuilt all that. No. But after that, yeah, I think you can have like like an ESXi server installed and then you use a mask to create stuff. Although I don't know why it would be metal as a service then. I don't know. No. That's right. They use IPMI and ILO interfaces and stuff. Because I uh, yeah. Because their IKMI have like historically lots of vulnerabilities and like dumb things with it. Like you, one version you can say, "Hey, what's your hash password?" It's like here it is. <laughs> and so once you crack it, then you're in. Um, and then you have full control over the hardware because it's IKMI. Um, but yeah, yeah. yeah. MAAS was like a replacement for IDRAC type stuff. It's the like controller of multiple IDRACs and IPMIs and ILOs. Yeah. Yeah. Stuff. yeah. So yeah, you can you can use that to like wipe out somebody else's server and install your own stuff on it. That, that's utterly terrifying. I mean, you have to break into it first, but then, yeah. Yeah. Could you just imagine like somebody's data center, like they have all their stuff, they, they worked on it, and then somebody breaks in and starts taking it over on the plane? My yeah, I don't know. yeah. <laughs> Sorry, that, that's where my mind goes. It, so, it sounds like a Bitcoin mine uh, to me. <laughs> yeah. Although everyone's going to notice. It's like, oh, where's the website? You know, where's our email? Why is all that stuff down? That's why you just find the, the one like dev server that no one ever looks at. Yeah. That's true. Or one of the like uh, child nodes of a uh, Hadoop cluster or something. No one's going to notice if it's a big enough cluster. Okay. <laughs> I, I would hope they notice one of the nodes in a cluster goes down. That's kind of my big deal. But anyway. But anyway, though, so yeah, uh, now that we've completely wandered off course into the bizarre land, uh, I suppose uh, we, we can uh, go forward here with. Uh, uh, at least the first part of uh, getting to know Git and uh, see how far we get before it gets too late and how many times I can get Git worked into a, a sentence here. But uh, um, uh, on that note here, uh, let's quick flip this back over and hit share screen. Okay, and here we go. And so, uh, if I can pull stuff out of the way here, oh, there we go. It's been a while since I've actually used the uh, PowerPoint slide deck here. I know the, the heresy here, but uh, getting Git. So I will be putting these, uh, Apparently, there's all sorts of conversations going on in uh, IRC here as well. But uh, uh, so, yeah, I'll be throwing these slides up to my uh, homepage here uh, afterwards. So if you don't see anything or you have questions, here we are. Uh, 
but otherwise uh, also this uh, is being recorded. So we'll dump it up to uh, the uh, uh, video uh, page as well here. So of course, in the beginning version control, there was final, final dot, this is, this time I really mean it, dot revision two, dot work in progress, dot docx. Yes, I, I know still some people use that uh, version control method uh, to this day. And it really makes me want to scream because there, there really is a better way to do this. So going all the way back to the early days, uh, there were various different iterations of version control all the way back in the 70s and the small iterations all the way up to uh, the first one that I actually had to touch was uh, CVS, which was all the way back in my intro to computers course back in uh, college. And of course, instantly, most of the people rebelled in the class and stood up our own subversion server because CVS was terrible. And the big improvements were like little things like directories were versioned. You could do atomic commits. File locking, which also is a big problem because if I claimed a file and then went off on uh, vacation, yeah, people are going to want to kill me when I get back. Uh, but it also did handle binary diffs rather than just holding the uh, replacement of it. Of course, the problem with binary diffs, as I'll get into here, is say you have a JPEG, you change it just a little bit, <laughs> it changes a lot. Even more so if you have a uh, MPEG movie or something like that. And of course, the biggest problem is it's still centrally in a server. So if you want to go off and work on your own at a coffee shop, well, you better have good internet because you're going to have a bad time. So there was a new, better way, Git. And uh, the great thing about their website is if you keep hitting refresh that everything is local, maybe there's a new tagline each time. And uh, so it's all sorts of fun cleverness, but it's uh, distributed version control. It can do everything from small to big uh, projects. In fact, uh, all the way out to like Microsoft's operating system. Although to do that, they, they had to do some terrible unholy things because it's huge. Uh, but in 05, it was made by Linus and others. And basically the whole idea is that it's supposed to be fast, keep your data uh, secure and uh, the integrity around. And then also branching is easy. And uh, it has a really clever, uh, why is it called Git uh, from the readme file? And basically it's a, a random three letter combination and it may have something to do with Git. Uh, it's also stupid, simple, take your pick. Uh, that's what Git uh, stands for if you're of the British persuasion. They come up with a few other things. Uh, and then also because it's Linus, there, there's some swearing involved in it. Uh, even the uh, man page uh, calls it the stupid content uh, tracker and uh, is rather helpful. But uh, anyway, though, that, that was the only big call out I have there. Uh, and of course, the, the thing is, though, uh, people have extended and built onto it. Uh, and everything that was old is now new again. So your centralized servers, so like your Azure DevOps, GitLab, GitHub, et cetera. And they've added on additional features like being able to have protected branches that uh, you have to go through CI CD to push to, or you, that only certain users can do stuff, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, they've also strapped unholy things like uh, Scrum or Kanban boards, backlogs, etc. Uh, CICD, secrets, security scans, all sorts of fun stuff like that, which is a little bit out of scope for this, but we'll dive into it a little bit if we have time. So the, the good and the bad parts here, good, it's standalone. You have a full copy of everything that's ever happened to your repo sitting right there on your disk. 
that is also a bad thing because you have a, a copy of everything that's ever been done on your disk. You'll see in a few minutes why that's a terrible thing. Good, it only keeps track of the deltas between versions of the file. For text, it's great. So if you change one word, it doesn't save a whole other copy of it. And as I hinted, you, you have everything right there. The big problem is, so what does a delta of something that changes a lot, like a JPEG or a movie or something like that? And you also are carrying a lot of baggage. So say you have a 20-year-old project that someone's been working in for 20 years. Well, you, you've got the whole world right there. And you probably don't care about that. So there, there are ways that you can get around that, but just by default, you know, you, you get the whole kit and caboodle. Is that even if that includes history before you got it? Yes. Before you get it. Okay. Yep. You you have the, the great thing for backups are each developer that checks out your thing has a backup of your entire Git repository of the branches that you care about. So like say main. Uh, it's uh, you, you have all of Maine. Uh, so uh, I didn't realize that. Yep. I knew that it was this point onward, but I didn't know it was. Yeah. So you you have the full universe sitting there, and of course, what would a presentation be without uh, a fun uh, quote from Twitter here? Uh, and uh, so uh, Corey Quinn here uh, apparently uh, is calling out that. It, uh, Logstash repository has a 113 megs uh, to pull down from GitHub if you want to check it out. And 66 of those is a binary uh, blob that got committed back in 2013. So over half of every single time that someone downloads that, that repo, it's uh, actually uh, some idiot's fault. Now, of course, if you follow on this conversation, he actually fesses up in about two tweets that that idiot was him. So uh, yeah, that, that's where there's a bit of a problem there. And one way around this, it's sort of subverting the whole idea that you have everything you absolutely need to get done. What you need uh, is uh, an extension called Git Large File uh, Storage. I'll uh, demo it here in a minute. Uh, by doing some very unholy things with uh, uh, ISO files. And uh, basically all it is is a pointer that says, hey, this big file, you can download it from this uh, HTTPS uh, web server instead. And so the backups are now on whatever that web server is. And uh, so it's great if you have binary files that are going to change or stuff like that, you no longer have to have uh, gigabytes of uh, repos sitting here. And of course, you can do things and get very far off the rails and uh, play a game of uh, Git Tartaro if you screw up badly enough. And uh, so the good news is the, the first thing that you have to do is don't panic. As long as you haven't pushed up to the central repo, it's okay. It's only your local computer that you've screwed up badly. And uh, there is a whole website around uh, how to uh, solve your problems. Uh, if you're at work and you don't want to swear, it's dangitget.com. Or if you're a little bit more uh, uh, irreverent, it's oshitget.com. And they go through and walk, walk you down off the ledge of here, here's what you need to do to uh, repair your uh, where you went off and made it look like that. So we, we can dive into that here in uh, the demo as well. So as I've been teasing demos here, we, we might as well uh, make our sacrifice to the demo gods here and just dive right in, if that works, yeah, maybe. Okay, there we go. Uh, so let's pull up a terminal here. Pull it out of the way here, utilities, and yes, this is a map, but we, we have Git on it, and uh, we're going to be in Bash, so it, it's going to be okay. 
will we'll survive here. So let's make this a little bit bigger. And CD into our uh, repo here. So because I'm dealing with multiple gigs of uh, ISOs here and having some fun, let's just CD into here. Okay, hopefully that's big enough that people can see. Let's see if I can't get this out of the way here. Okay, so uh, let's make a, a new directory here, call it demo, demo2. And so demo2. So first we want to create a new uh, Git repository. The uh, first thing we do is let's make sure Git is actually installed on our machine. Would help if I could version. And there you can see, yep, it is. And so let's go git init. And there are uh, uh, GUIs that you can use to uh, make this look pretty and all that stuff. But uh, you can do everything from the command line here. And since uh, Will sort of inspired me here, we're, we're going to stay command line here. So uh, let's go ahead and just create a demo file here. So So here we have a text file with hi world. And we've made some changes here. And now let's go ahead and add it to the uh, So one of the ways that you can add files to uh, basically your working set that you want to change, you just go git add and the name of the file, or you can do git add period, and that's everything that in that folder. And then we can uh, commit it. Uh, commit. Dash M is the comment. So in it. And there we can see we changed one file, et cetera. Now, now let's go ahead and uh, commit in so something really big and bad and evil. So uh, let's see here. Back one. And I think, yep, ISO. And let's just go ahead and grab. Uh, the Debian, Debian net install iso because that's fairly small in the range of things here. Let's copy it in. Take it a second. Okay, now we go get add period. And of course, it's going to choke just a little bit here. or it's going to choke a lot a bit. Uh, <laughs> anytime now here. Ray, apparently this isn't a USB uh, 3 uh, slot that I have this plugged into. Uh, whoops. Yeah. There we go. OK, so then get. Uh, uh, commit Oops. You need a quote if you're going to have spaces. Okay, so there we go. We've uh, checked in one thing. Uh, now if we go and look at the log here, we can see what the last uh, what the, the check-ins in this branch have been, and we're uh, currently at the head of the master branch. And yes, I know that that's what default it's called. Uh, you can change it to main, but here we are. Uh, so you can see there's my first commit and then bad things 
and etc. So uh, one of the other fun things that you can do is blame uh, and the name of the file here. So uh, uh, there you can see that uh, it was my basically line one high world was committed by me at that time. It's my fault. Uh, other fun ones that you can do is uh, uh, get, there's only one branch currently. So if we uh, create branch, a new uh, branch here. Now, if we look at the, there you see branch. So uh, test is a whole separate branch where we can check in and change things. So let's switch over to it. Uh, And now we can change uh, the uh, demo text to read hi world. I don't want to say hi to the world. Let's just say hi to test. Mm -hmm. uh, so then we go get add again, get net. And there now, if we uh, switch back over to main, uh, get check out master. Sorry, now if we cat that uh, uh, demo, see it's still saying hi world. So uh, in theory, I could be working on my set of features, you could be working on your set of features, and we won't step on each other's toes if we're in separate branches. But now it's time to actually merge them together. So you can go uh, get merge test. And now if we go cat, demo.txt. Now you can see it took my changes. And of course, now if you, you have multiple different uh, conflicting things, then you, you have to uh, reconcile those. And it, it's a little bit more painful. But for the simple case here, you can see that we uh, sort of have that working there. So if we look at the uh, git log, there you can see that uh, it now shows that we're at the head of both master and test because they're uh, back together if you look at it in a subway uh, map fashion. Uh, so yeah, the, the other thing here is let's quick uh, set up a, uh, a GitLab. Uh, so, you didn't use push at all for any of that. Coming. Uh, we, we have to have somewhere to push it to. So I'm going to just quick spin up a new repo here. Let's just create a blank repo and call this test two. And let's make it public so anyone who wants to see it can see it because I've got nothing to hide. And create project. And then we just go with, uh, okay, let's see here. This is the spot where my, so git uh, add, git remote, add, add origin, and the name of the, uh, Git repo there. Now, if we go git push, oh, and we haven't uh, set an upstream branch here. So, if we hopefully take its uh, 
suggestion there. And now I'm going to take a uh, hot second here because of uh, the, the fact that I've got that large, nasty uh, ISO in there because we did bad things. Now, of course, the big problem is now if I go and delete it uh, and you go to check it out, you're still going to get that full ISO fun there. Where with LFS, the, the moment we uh, actually enable LFS on it and do another push, it will be on that web server and it's only there if you actually want to look at it. Is so, there a way to manually go in and like say these transactions didn't exist and therefore the ISO is gone? Yep. Yeah, there, there are ways of rewriting it. Uh, it it's somewhat rewriting history. Yeah, it's it's somewhat seen as dirty pool because especially wait, what the heck just happened? You got the office. I <laughs> did get the office. That, that's not what's the Apple TV. Well, we were using the Apple TV all along here. Right, well, like so, that on yours? so it's being broadcasted. <laughs> the projector is at the room. Yeah, so. So he needs to recast his laptop to the Apple TV. Yep, so here we go. We need to add display. That was an obsessively long HDMI cable for the distance it is traversing. Okay, so let's enable. Yeah, be sure. Just <laughs> okay, there, there we are back again. Cool. Okay, so here we are back again. So we, we've now pushed. And so. And it's not on Zoom. Oh, darn it. We're going to have one of those days today. So let's share. Sure. We share our desktop again, and here we are back again. So hooray! Uh, so now, now we we've actually managed to push, and everything's all happy there, except for we have this large file that's obnoxious. So let's go ahead and enable uh, LFS. So get. This is literally like a magic trick. You pull down the curtain. <laughs> okay, that's some stuff right in the back. Get LFS. Uh, install. And if you get an error message at this point, you need to go uh, to the LFS, just do a Google search for get LFS and uh, download the extension onto Git and install it to your machine. And it, it will be just fine. But so now that we've uh, got LFS enabled, we want to tell it that we want to track the uh, files that are ISO uh, extensions. So we go get LFS track asterisk dot ISO. Okay, yes, ISP, but ISO is what I actually wanted to say. Okay, so anyway, though, so this is added. Is that per repo? Yes. Okay. So this added a git attributes file. So if it's telling me right here that you need to go to that URL to actually do the merge request, what all did the git push actually do? So apparently I have uh, it. Uh, it looks like it uh, created. No, let's take a. I, I so like the push it says push we should go to the down. server. That, that's a good call out here. I, I didn't so actually read. So, yeah. but I, I already have SSH enabled on this machine. So, that, that's a. But don't you have to go per repo? Uh, no, per it's account. per account uh, for here. So, let's just go ahead and take a look at what. My, my branches look like here. So I pushed to master three minutes ago. But let's just take a look and see, are my files actually there? 
So right. yes, they, they did appear there. Apparently that was a red herring telling me that I, I really should create a merge request. That, that's more just their good hygiene sort of side of things. So if they're here, why aren't they in the repo when you're back on the main page? They, they are, uh, um, so if we go here to the main page, Okay, did it? Huh. Yeah, there are two branches. So did you push them to a secondary basket? Oh, let's just take a look at branches here. Oh, main oh. basket. Oh, darn it. So, so uh, in the, the interest of being inclusive and et cetera, uh, GitLab, has uh, no longer uh, has main as the or no, has master at, yeah flip that has master as the the uh, primary branch they they have a branch called main instead and by default apparently it's protected so let's just go ahead and uh, uh, show this as a uh, let's create a merge request. Which it's good practice that main is protected or whatever the <laughs> primary branch is. Yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. This is definitely the right thing to do. Yeah. But so basically, at this point, I create a merge request, which then uh, we could all get together and talk about, and people would give a thumbs up, a thumbs down, et cetera. And of course, it's going to really choke on it here because this is like a. Like uh, it contains an ISO. You should find yeah. down it. Yeah. That's yeah. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, though, and I'm going to close it, it out. It says award added. That's hilarious. You award it in the thumbs down. Yep. So I, I just closed it because it's a bad merge. So let, let's go ahead and go forward with fixing this ISO. So as you can see here, by uh, doing these things, I created this git attributes, which tells it to use uh, LFS for anything that's an ISO file. So let's quick check that in. So let's just go git add. And of course, that was in this. There we go. And then get, uh, sorry, here, uh, get commit dash M now with LFS. And it's going to think about it for a second. And uh, now you can see that it rewrote uh, the uh, Debian file because it's now an LFS uh, handle instead. So let's go get push. And now, unfortunately, we're going to re-upload that ISO because it's going to upload it to uh, LFS uh, server now instead. So you can see it's pushing it to a GitLab debtor blah, blah, blah uh, URL. And of course, that's going to go terribly slow. So anyway, though. Still more than a megabyte per second. So probably three megabytes per second. Make that. Yes, I, I always set my. Uh, I feel that things should go faster than what it, it actually does. But so anyway, though. So the good news is now it's not going to be stored in your local uh, Git folder. But the problem is right now it's still actually is because that old version of that file is still sitting there. So next we're going after we get done pushing, we're we're going to actually fix that problem. Yeah. And yeah, and 
in addition to like removing files that you didn't need, like you might have to remove a password that you had hard coded. And so that's another really good reason to like delete something on a history. Yep. So let, let's just go ahead and pretend here because this is going to take quite a while. <laughs> Zero percent. Yeah. And anyway, the get LFS, migrate, import, yes, no, <laughs> rewrite. And then this is where you can do that. Uh, Debian ISO, and then you can also do uh, get expire unreachable equals now, and this will go through and basically get rid of any of those things that are no longer in your uh, repo that are reachable or basically are now orphaned uh, objects. So then the final thing you want to do is get GC for garbage collect and uh, prune equals now. And there you can see it's uh, going ahead and rewriting the, the world and it will now be uh, clear of that uh, nasty little ISO that was causing so much trouble. But of course, since it's a slow USB drive, here we are. So the, those were the, the big cool demo -y stuff that uh, uh, I uh, had to, to show here, and of course, assuming we, we had faster internet, that, that would upload faster. And I'll uh, post my uh, basically log of all these commands and what they actually mean, along with the, the uh, PDF of the uh, slide deck. So uh, uh, Will has posted the uh, a link also to uh, a game called ohmygit.org, and uh, it uh, is a game that teaches you how to use Git, uh, apparently. I, I think I've seen it before, but I, I'm not as familiar with it. But uh, yeah, so uh, the, the other features here that are kind of uh, cool is that uh, like, for example, you can set up uh, CICD pipelines, which uh, Will was going to demo. I think we're starting to hit sort of a natural breaking point. I, I know you can wander down that rabbit hole for a very long time. So I, I don't know that we want to maybe dive into that yet uh, tonight here. But uh, <laughs> Basically, that next step, once you get the stuff checked in and merge it to main, you can automatically kick off the, that thing that will run either in the cloud or on your local computer or wherever. Can you do it on a schedule? Yes. Yes, you can. And I can demo it right now. Yep. Uh, let's go ahead and uh, kick it over here to you. And you also want to um, record enough to, to show. Um, yes. Uh, well, we'll go this ahead. we can leave the recording on. There okay. are stuff if you wanted to see the holy grail of things you should not do with pipelines, but we did anyway, and it's kind of impressive. Why, well, yes. So I think we, we, yeah, we might have got a non recording demo of that at one point, but I like. Oh, no, you haven't seen this I, one. I am a low average user in terms of the GitLab stuff. Yep, the, that's why I, I tried to go with the hey, I, I'm just an idiot, give me the command line level uh, stuff, which they, there are several different uh, uh, graphical user interfaces that make it even easier, but everything you can do in the graphics, you can do in uh, Git uh, by command line. Uh, looks like we probably want to make that slightly bigger. Uh, so we're going to go have some fun on this one. All right, so first things first, I have a project where I have a Helm install. 
Um, so where did I put it? So I put in my talk for the Google thing. Aha. Oh, uh, well, before I do anything else there, I need to turn on my runner. So I have some runners locally that I'm going to be playing with today. So let's do sudo system CTL start GitLab runner. Get, so when everyone talks about, oh, GitLab CI. Uh, so we all saw the landscape thing, right? Now imagine the Ubuntu landscape linked to a file that's in GitLab. And then when you register the GitLab runner to that file or in that project in GitLab, it'll go run that code on that machine. So say you have your runner running on your web server. Hold on, uh, we're gonna go have fun with this. So let's go make this complicated. I still happen to have a Kubernetes cluster running in the cloud. So let's go make a temp runner in the cloud to go do something. I, I was thinking from an education standpoint of just like, yeah, why are some simple things without being too complicated so people learning can, can keep up? So like say you could have a runner with uh, a version of uh, GCC on it. And when you check your code in, it automatically builds your project for you. Yes, yeah, so like the CI CD pipeline, you have an action or something in your like GitLab that's triggered. Or even, or even just as simple as I guess in my my upcoming use case, even just as simple as every at this time every week, let's say Sunday at midnight, I want to deploy these three files to this spot on the file system. Yes, you totally do doable. Now it's four. Yeah, really it's it's a total abuse of what it is. Yeah. <laughs> What would be the right way to do that if that's the end goal? Okay, hold on. I will show you that, but I'm, uh, is everyone okay with me shutting off the demo for right now so I can show you the cool stuff with that? Yeah, let's go ahead and kill the, the record. Yeah, it's going to be on you 